We're living at a time of great hopelessness and despair. It's almost epidemic how much hopelessness it is in our world. And it, it has many negative consequences in society. Young people carrying weapons to school and shooting other students. This week again in the state of California, another young man who was classified and considered by people around him, teachers and students, as being an ordinary student, a normal student, on his 16th birthday, packed a gun in his backpack and went to school and shot six other people, killing two and wounding himself through that. Uh, partner violence, husbands and wives abusing one another, anxiety, depression, self-directed violence. Whoever heard, you know, decades ago of cutting yourself? We tried to keep from getting cut. Uh, but uh, people are cutting themselves and hurting themselves uh, on purpose. Addictions and so much more. Hopelessness is the leading predictor of suicide and it's more closely associated with suicide than depression. That is the reality of our culture. People today live in hopelessness. But what is the antidote for hopelessness? Can you tell me? What is the antidote for, for hopelessness? Jesus, absolutely. Faith. Okay, go ahead and show them. Hope. Now, those letters are in elephant font, 90 point, and bold. And so I want you to say that word hope big and bold. Okay, can we say it together? Hope. 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 Amen. That is the antidote for hopelessness. Now, what you were saying is absolutely correct. Jesus and faith. That's where we place our hope. That's where we find our hope. And that's what we want to talk about today. Where do you find hope? And we want to talk about that in our sermon today. Our title of our message is Hope in the Scriptures as we continue uh, your best life sermon series. And we're looking at Romans chapter 15. I just put down a couple verses there uh, for, for the text, but it's actually the entire chapter that we are looking at. But Paul begins by, by telling us what our response to those who are weak should be. We talked last week about some being strong and weak in, in their faith. How do, we, how do we respond to people who are weak in faith? We bear with their feelings and we build them up. In Romans 15, 1 and 2, he says, We who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good and build him up. And so as we as a congregation are going through uh, a, a time of, of, of sorrow and, and a time of, of difficulty in so many ways, in so many families, uh, we are to come together. Some of us that are here this morning might be going through times of celebration. You might be going through times of success. You might be going through times of, of health. And we are to come around one another and those who are burdened and those who, who are stressed to come around them and encourage them and to build them up. And we want to look at several ways this morning of, of where we can find hope. And the first one that Paul gives to us is we find hope in Scripture. We give hope in Scripture. And he says it's through the endurance of script in Scripture, okay? And so when Paul was writing this, there was, new, there was no New Testament. Uh, the New Testament was being lived out. The Gospels uh, had not even been written yet, but, but they had already been lived out. Jesus had come and lived and died and, and rose again, and the Holy Spirit came, and, and we have the book of Acts. But, but through Paul's writing, 
the, the scriptures that we have in the New Testament were just being lived out and, and, and being recorded. But we're going to take a big view of scripture and, and look at it as we would look at it today, both the Old and the New Testaments. But as Paul was writing here, he's pointing us back to the Old Testament. And, and, and you know, when you're going through times that you need endurance, when you need your hope to be strengthened and, and you need to be encouraged in, in the Lord, uh, Paul tells us to read the stories of the Bible. And, and I just went to Hebrews chapter 11. These are the heroes of, of the faith that, that the writer of Hebrews put down. Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and, and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, and many others. If, if you are in despair and, and you want to know how does God work and will God work in your life, read these stories. And, and again, Elijah would have been part of the prophets and Daniel and all. And look at what they went through and look how God brought them through and, and God uh, brought, gave them great endurance. In Romans 15:4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. That's why we have the Old Testament. Sometimes people say, well, Jesus is my Savior and I only need to read the New Testament. No, we need to understand why Jesus is here, how he got here, and, and, and the prophecies and all of those things of the, of the Old Testament. Now, if, if the children that just went out, and, and us, when we were children, if you went to church, we heard Bible stories. And, and many of these names are familiar to us. But we learned them individually, here and there, not necessarily all tied together and what their meaning was, and we didn't have experiences of life. If you haven't read your, New Te or, excuse me, your Old Testament lately, go back now at this point in life, as adults, as, as people with responsibilities, as people with disappointments, as, as people who, who are maybe longing for hope. Paul says, go back and, and read those Scriptures. They were written to teach us endurance and to give us hope. And we might say, well, I'm familiar with it. I can tell the story of Moses, and I can tell the story of Daniel, and I can tell this story and that story. But are you really looking at it through the eyes of an adult or are you looking at it through the eyes of that innocent child who really didn't know what pain and suffering and responsibility and life was all about? These can, can give us hope for endurance and, and, and encouragement. In Hebrews 11.39, talking about all these people that were listed in Hebrews 11, 11.39 and, and 40, it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The, the Old Testament was written to point us to Jesus. And they didn't see their prophecies. Even the words that came out of their own mouth, they did not see them fulfilled until Jesus came. But for us to really have a grasp on Jesus, we need to understand the Old Testament and the prophecies as well. So go back and read those stories. And put yourself in those stories. What would it have been like to have been with Moses crossing the Red Sea? What would it have been like to be with Joshua as they crossed the Jordan and went into the Promised Land? What would it have been like for Abraham to, to uh, be called to leave his homeland and go into a land that God didn't even tell him where he was going. He just said, go. And Abraham went. And on and on. And, and, to, and to apply it in your own life and see how God can bring hope and encouragement to you. We, as we look at, at the rest of what Paul is saying here in, in Romans 15, Paul also tells us that we are to put our hope in God. Hope in God. And that means trust. We, we need to trust God. When, when we're children, we trust our parents. They're bigger than us. They're older than us. They have a job. They have responsibilities. And... Uh, we don't, we don't ask for something and then wonder how they're going to pay for it. Do, you know, do your children come up to you or when you were a child, did you ever stop and think, well now, if, if I ask for this, how's dad and mom going to pay for it? No. Children just ask. 
They don't, they don't worry about it. They trust. And, and that's the way we're to come to God. We don't have to worry about how God's going to do it. From our side, it may feel hopeless. It, it, it may, we may feel helpless. We may feel like there's no answer. But Paul says, trust in God. That's our hope. Our hope is in God. We trust Him even with the things that we, we don't understand. In Romans 15, 13, Paul writes, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will fill you with joy. He will fill you with peace. And, and you will overflow with hope. In, in a society that is characterized by hopelessness, Paul says if you place your trust in God, not only will you have hope, you will overflow with hope in, as you trust in God. The, the writer of Proverbs, in Proverbs 3, verses 5-7, to 7, said this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Rick Warren likes to say, pray before you pay. If you're going to make a, a big decision, if you're going to make a big purchase, pray about it first. And sometimes God will even provide what you need before you, you do it. I, I remember back in the, in the 1980s, in, from 81 to 84, our, our sons were just small, and we, we bought, I shouldn't blame my wife for this, I pushed for it. We went out and bought our first brand new vehicle. It was a little Chevy Vega. And in 1984, we were called to a church in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, a backyard mechanic that lived across the street from us, I was having some problems, and I had him look at it. And uh, he said, oh, you're, that transmission is bad. He said, I, I would get rid of that car before I moved to Georgia. I wouldn't, even drive, I wouldn't even drive that down there. And I thought, well, I don't want to do that. I want to get another car where, where I'm going to live so I can get service and all that stuff. And uh, so we did, and we went down, and I just took this man's word, right, and uh, bought a, another brand new car. When we took it for a test drive, it had six miles on it, and it was a little Chevy Cavalier, and it had a roof rack on top of it, and we were living uh, 14 hours away from our family, so we would load that thing up, and uh, we had a station wagon. Now, don't tell any of the safety people today, but we would put the back that seat down, and our boys would sleep back there uh, in, in the back, and uh, we would get a, we got a luggage carrier and put the luggage up on top, and we would take off up over the mountains and hills uh, to Pennsylvania. Well, we bought this brand new car. Uh, it was in August, and on Labor Day, it started acting just like the old car that we had just gotten rid of. Took it back, and they said, oh, uh, the gasket for the transmission fluid wasn't put on right, and it tore, and the transmission fluid was leaking out. And I got to thinking, you know, that, that car that we just got rid of probably just had needed some more transmission fluid or checked for a transmission leak, and I traded it in on another brand new car and another debt, another payment with little boys that we were getting ready to put in Christian school. And it was, it was miserable for four years paying on that car and paying all the car repairs. That little four-cylinder Cavalier was not, met, was not built as a pickup truck. And uh, with all the weight on that and all these trips, we made like 14 trips up uh, to Pennsylvania during those years, and uh, it, it just died. And, and the, the night before, we had already made arrangements to trade the car. The night before, it just broke down at a at a stop sign, and all the lights went out, everything. There was no electric in the car. We had to, we had to get towed. That's another whole story. I'm not going to get into all of that, but that was, well, what a mess. But here's the point that I want to get to, okay? I might not be the brightest person in the world, but I learned my lesson. Pray before you pay. And to this day, I remember in that parsonage in Atlanta, Georgia, when Jane and I and our two little boys got down by that sofa and I wept and I prayed 
And I said, God, forgive me. I took other people's advice. I wanted to have a nice new car. And I went out and I bought it and I didn't ask your opinion about it at all. And I am sorry. And if you will give us a car that's dependable, I'll give you the glory. I got a phone call from a friend. and He, he knew we were looking for a car. There was a 1987 Buick. And this was now 1988. And it had 10,000 miles on one year old and saved thousands of dollars over going out and buying another new car. We bought that car in 88. I drove it as the main car until about 95. My wife took it for going to the grocery store and all kinds of local driving. And we got another car then. And then our oldest son turned 16, and he drove that car for two years, going back and forth to school and to his job and all that kind of stuff. Then he graduated, went to college. Our youngest son took that car and drove it uh, for two years while he was learning to drive and going through high school and his job. And uh, then when he went away to college, the car came back to mom. We drove that car, I think it was... 2001 or 2002, it had 114,000 miles on it. 214, 214, I'm sorry, 214,000 miles on it. And I sold it to a lady in the church for $1,000 for her daughter who always wrecked cars. And about six weeks later, she wrecked that one. But it didn't owe me a thing. 215,000. Uh, the, the, the Cavalier, I don't even think, made it to 60,000. But you understand what I'm saying? When something comes in, trust God. Trust God. Go to Him. Don't just get what you want. Don't just, just don't get what you think it, it, other people tell you. Ask God. And, and He will provide. And never had such a bad lemon again after that. Okay. Then Paul says, he didn't get my cavalier in this text, but I put that in there. Uh, next he says, hope in Jesus. In the gospel. In Romans 15, 8 and 9. It says, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. You see, we are to trust in Jesus. And in Romans 15, 17, 18, therefore, I glorify or glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. And that takes us back then as we think of putting our trust in Jesus all the way back to Romans chapter 1 when he was introducing his letter to the Romans. And in Romans uh, chapter 1 verses 16 and 17, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You see, our hope is not in our wisdom. Our hope is not in our strength. Our hope is not in our creativity. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And that's the message that we have to give to the world. As, as, as a church, uh, a cross point, it's where hope and where life and hope connect. That's what we're all about. We want to bring people in the midst of their life, in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of their hopelessness, to bring them to Jesus Christ, for there is their hope. And then Paul goes on and he says, hope in the Holy Spirit. And, and he uses the word sanctify to, to uh, illustrate this portion or to title this portion. In Romans 15, verses 15 to 16, it says, I have written you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You see, we, we need to realize even the gift that we give to God 
The, the things that we give to Him, if we, if we give Him our whole life, it comes through the Holy Spirit. You do not become an offering that's acceptable to God through your good works or through your good intentions or even through your religious activities or through self-control or keeping rules or political positions or your education or by building wealth or even by human effort. If you have a story of how you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps, both the bootstraps and the strength that you have came from God. It all is from God. And we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. He, by the sanctifying of the Holy Spirit, He makes us into a, an offering acceptable to God. It's not what we do, it's what He does. We have to trust in Him and put our hope in Him. And then we become an offering acceptable to God by the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 15, verse 19, it says, By the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit, so from Jerusalem all the way around I, I, Lyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Here we see both the declaration of the Word and the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Stephen Elliott, professor at Kingswood University, and he's the superintendent over the Canadian churches of the Wesleyan Church, he said this, the number one reason people go to church is not out of a need or desire to connect relationally to others, but out of a deep-seated longing to experience and encounter the God of the universe. That's why we're here this morning, is to encounter God, to encounter His, His presence. When, when the worship team is up here, and I prayed for them this morning, it, that's not about them and their talent and their ability. It's about God. And, and as the people upstairs handle the technology, it's not about them. It's about God. As we gather here, it's not just to come and see our friends and hang out together. There are a million places in this world where we can go and hang out together with friends. We come to experience the presence of God. And one of the reasons, I believe, in the book that Steve Elliott wrote, one of the reasons that the church is so weak today in America is because we don't expect a miracle and we don't get a miracle. In other parts of the world, revival flames are burning because they have no hope. They don't have money. Many of them don't have food. Some of them are living on, on as little as $1 to $2 a day. Uh, and, and they're living in, in places where they depend on their crops and they, and they are, are devastated by famine and drought. They depend on God. And you know what? They see miracles every day. But we have all these other things. Everything just kind of flows to us and we don't expect a miracle. Come to church exper ex to ex expecting to experience and encounter God. Why else would we come to church if it's not to experience and encounter God? Believe God for miraculous signs and wonders to happen among us. We don't pray just as an exercise. We don't anoint just as a ceremony. We believe that God is able to heal and restore and to meet the needs of people and to answer prayers. Are there any amens in the church? Our problems are the door to miracles that only God can perform. If you don't have a problem, you don't need a miracle. And too many Americans feel like they can handle life themselves. And they build everything on their own abilities. And when it comes crashing down, they are hopeless. But we find our hope in Scripture in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you have a problem this morning, you are a prime candidate for a miracle. Because that's what a miracle is, is God's intervention into our problems. The, the last one that we want to look at is hope in prayer. And this is a partnership. In Romans 15, verses 30 to 32, I urge you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem 
may be acceptable to the saints there, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. Paul is, is calling to people that he hadn't even been to Rome yet. He just wrote a letter to them. And he's inviting them to join him in the struggles of ministry. He, he talks in, in, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians, he talks about all the things he's been through, the beatings and, and shipwrecks and all of the things that we read about in the book. He lists all of those things and the peril even of death. And he's inviting the Roman people to the Christians in Rome to join in with him in the struggle through prayer. And that his service would be acceptable. And that they would be able to rejoice. You know, when we send a missionary overseas and they come home with a testimony of victory, their victory is our victory. We help support them and put them there. And, 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 and we celebrate and, and we are refreshed along with the person that we're praying for. As, as Paul w was hoping to be able to come to Rome and to be with them. Right now, as we sit here, we're in the eighth day of ten days of prayer at Cross Point. I trust that you've been following along. I know that the emails didn't get to you the, exactly the same time every day. It kind of flipped back and forth between six and eight. But this is our eighth day. And I encourage you, not just during these ten days, but to join in the struggle by praying for your church, your pastor, the Cross Point vision, and not only during specific days of prayer, but daily. You see, we really don't have anything to offer but Jesus. We don't have anything to offer in our own strength. It's not our programs. It is not performances. It's not special events. It's not doing these kinds of things and yard sales and, and promotions and all of that. The only thing that will transform people's lives is the power of God in their lives. And so that only happens through prayer. If we're not praying for our children's ministry, if we're not praying for our youth ministry, if we're not praying for our adults, if we're not praying for worship and our worship team, if we're not praying for the outreach ministries, the Good News Club, you know what? We're just, quote-unquote, good people doing good things, trying to have, do the best we can. But when we are empowered by prayer, God can do things through us that we can't do ourselves. And so I call you to join us in prayer. Years ago, before I came here to be your pastor, I had a sermon on prayer and was talking about the need for prayer. And I was calling people just like this this morning to, to pray for your church and to pray for the workers in the church and to pray for your pastor. A, a young lady came up who was a brand new Christian and she said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. She said, I've been saved now for several months. And she said, I knew you were supposed to pray for me, but I didn't know I was supposed to pray for you. And she said, I'm going to start praying for you. I, if, if, if there's anybody here that doesn't know it, I need your prayers. This church needs your prayers. Every leader of this church needs your prayers. Every worker in the ministries of this church need your prayers. And so Paul's calling us into partnership with him. The tendency for us when we feel hopeless is to turn away from God, to turn away from God's Word, and to turn away from God's people. We just want to be alone. And you know what? When you do that, you are stepping right into Satan's trap. When, when he can isolate you and keep you away from God's people and God's Word and, and, and prayer, when he, when he can get you to doubt God, then he can discourage you and make you feel hopeless. When you feel hopeless, or even before you get to that part, when you just begin to feel down, don't turn away from God, turn to God. Don't turn away from God's Word, go to God's Word. Don't turn away from assembling together with God's people. Make sure you don't miss coming together with God's people. Because that's where you get your encouragement. When you're discouraged, depressed, or defeated, 
when you're lonely, lost, or are experiencing a loss, when you feel that you're secure and safe and celebrating successes, you will find hope in God's Word. Because if you're, if you're experiencing successes today, at some point you're going to experience a failure. And if you are putting your trust in your success, it's going to let you down. But God's Word will not let you down. Paul said everything that was written was written for our benefit, to teach us, to encourage us, to teach us endurance, and to give us hope. So this morning, I pray that you will pray for your pastor and your church, but that even for yourself, that you will determine when failure comes, not if, but when, because we all face failure, when something difficult comes, when we face a loss or a discouragement, make up your mind now. I will not turn away from God. I will not turn away from God's Word. I will not turn away from God's people. But in those dark hours, I will turn to God and His Word and His people. Why? Because that's where you find hope. That's where you find hope. And hope is the antidote to hopelessness. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise this morning. And you know all the needs that are here. You know the heaviness of heart that many are experiencing because of things that they're going through in their life. And we're so glad that they didn't turn away from the house of God this morning. I pray that your word has been an encouragement to them and, and the prayers and the concern of God's people have been an encouragement to them. And Lord, that we can encourage one another. And Lord, help us to drive down a stake today that no matter what happens to us, that we're going to trust in God, that we're going to trust in His Word, and that we're going to trust in the people of God, and that we're going to come together and worship and honor You. Lord, we don't know what we're going to face this week, but Lord, we can make a determination that whatever it is, that we're going to face it with You. We're going to depend upon You. We're going to trust You in all our ways acknowledge you and we're going to trust you with our lives lord go forth with us this week some people have some daunting tasks ahead of them this week some will face difficulties that they know nothing about today some are going into a week of celebration and promotions and good things happening Lord, whatever way we go, help us not to turn away from you. And Lord, we pray that if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you as Savior and has never turned to you, that even in this moment, that they would turn to Jesus, confess their sin, repent, turn, turn around from their sin and turn to Jesus and find forgiveness in him and decide today to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, send us forth to be encouraged in you. We're not alone in this world. We're not alone in this battle. We're not alone in the difficulties that we face. But just like it took many of us to put this hundred boxes here, it takes many of us to build encouragement in the life of one another. May you be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.